Welcome to freedomlovin.com, where we focus on building freedom in an unfree world. Through personal development, location independence, and passive income strategies. Now here's your host, Kevin Koskella. Welcome to Freedom Lovin'. This is Kevin, and this is episode number 93. Thanks so much for listening. In just a minute, I have an interview coming up with Jake DeSillis from The Voluntary Life about his new book, Job Free. And that's about how you can break free from the job that is possibly holding you back in life. So uh, before we continue on, this episode is brought to you by 100mustreads.com. Access the power of over 150 business book summaries from cutting-edge new books like Zero to One by Peter Thiel to classics like The 4-Hour Workweek. So I've been listening to one book each day, and it just takes about 30 minutes. So it's pretty cool because you can get the highlights of a really good business book in just about 30 minutes. And so you can say you, you're reading a book a day without having to spend uh, eight hours or 10 hours or something. So, um, oh, and uh, we did have an iTunes review come in. So I want to read that off. And this is Life Changing Information, Five Stars by Hannah Half Moon. This podcast has changed my life. Kevin has introduced me to the world of opportunity. I've learned so many tips about how to save money through travel, Airbnb, paying your rent to earn airline points, and how to earn money while exploring new places. Further, this podcast has opened my eyes to the problems with the dominating systems of today and the potential within myself through self-discovery. Kevin has inspired me to leave my 9-to-5 job as a school teacher and follow my passions and potential by creating my own business as a traveling yogi. Kevin speaks from his own vulnerability and experiences. He connects with each guest, the interviews, and they share meaningful experiences and philosophies as well. I've engaged with every episode and I'm hungry for more. Well, thanks, Hannah, and good luck with your project. I, I really appreciate the awesome review and best of luck with everything that you are trying to accomplish this year. And if you want to give us a review on iTunes yourself, I'd love to hear from you. You can just open up your iTunes. And apparently, so something new I found out that you cannot do this on your mobile phone. So there is no way to review a podcast from the iTunes app on your phone. So you have to do it on your computer, unfortunately. So you can just go to your computer, open up uh, iTunes, and then search for Freedom Love and Podcast, and then you can... Just go ahead and uh, click on rating or review and put it in there. But you can also search from it in your browser. So you can, uh, whatever search engine you're using, you can actually just search Freedom, Love, and Podcast, and then it'll come up. You can click on it, and then you can see my podcast and see where you can put a review in there. So hopefully one of those methods work for you if you want to help us out here. So just a couple more things. I wanted to let everyone know if you are new, we have a Facebook group, and it's the Freedom, Love, and Quest Facebook group. So to access that. That's a free group. So anyone can join. Uh, we talk about anything from travel to building businesses to uh, freedom in any kind of realm. So feel free to join that on Facebook. And that's facebook.com slash groups slash freedom loving. And remember, there's no G at the end of that. So I would love to have you in that group. And I will accept you if you uh, if you want to join. And we also have, if you are into Bitcoin, each of these podcasts, I have a link to donate Bitcoin. So I've got a couple donations for, you know, somebody donated like 50 cents worth of Bitcoin and someone else donated a little bit more than that. And uh, so that's like a, it's like a little tip. So if you are inclined, just go to freedomloving.com and you'll see that on the posts. And I've also got some upcoming podcasts that I'm really excited about. So uh, the next one is going to be about uh, NVC, nonviolent communication. And then I've got another one on life hacks. And then I'm going to talk about asset protection. And then another one on digital nomadism, which is a common topic around here. So I'm really excited for that. I'm also looking to get somebody that gave a TED Talk on multi-potentialism. I've been working on trying to get her on the show for a while. And uh, I think she would be a really awesome guest for Freedom Lovin'. So I'm looking forward to getting her on the show, hopefully mid-February. And so that's about all I had before we get to the interview. So I hope you're doing well. Go out there and build some freedom. And here's my interview with Jake DeSillis. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. 
All right. Well, I'm really excited to have Jake DeSillis back on the show again for the second time. And Jake runs the Voluntary Life podcast at thevoluntarylife.com. And he just released a book, brand new book called Job Free. Welcome back to Freedom Love and Jake. Thanks, Kevin. It's great to be back. Yeah. So I was looking and you've actually written two books since the last time that we spoke on the podcast. And I didn't even realize that. Mm So uh, maybe if you want to talk about the first book that you wrote, The Becoming an Entrepreneur, just a quick overview of that before we get into what's been going on now. Sure. Yeah. Well, that was my book about uh, becoming an entrepreneur and, and really focusing on how entrepreneurship can give you more freedom and fulfillment. So how to find freedom and fulfillment as a business owner. And the aim of that book was really just to identify all the ways in which, you know, you can use entrepreneurship as a way to gain more freedom in your own life. Based on my own experience, I built a company, sold a company, achieved financial independence. And that's one of the things that I've done since selling my company is decided to write. And so that book is is really a guide all about entrepreneurship and especially about the psychological challenges that everyone faces when going into business. Right, right. And now, so and you've been living your talk, you've been traveling around and living in different places and you guys started originally from the UK, but uh, now you've landed in Panama, right? Yes, that's right. My wife Hannah and I, for the last few years, we've been easing into a life of permanent slow travel and we started off in Mexico in fact I think you and I recorded our last show in Mexico when you came to visit us there that's right and um and so that was great fun and we would go back to the UK over the summers and travel all winter and then uh, go back to the UK over the summers and that was great but it also had hassles associated with it you know having a an apartment with people we were renting to and then breaking things and having to sort of deal with those kind of things. We just decided in the end, you know, let's just sell everything and travel slowly through the world. And so that's what we've decided to do. I now, everything I own now fits in two bags and we're here in Panama, which is our first stop. And we like it so much that we've actually decided to stay here for a while because it's just really good fun. Yeah. What is it that you like about Panama? And you're in Panama City. Yes, that's right. Panama City, I mean, I, I didn't know that much about it, but it is so dynamic. This is a place where the 2008 recession never happened. It's oh. just a really booming economy. It's a very entrepreneurial place. There's lots and lots of people from all over the world here. So it's an interesting kind of mix and melting pot. There's lots and lots of expats, but there's also Chinese people and just generally people from all over Latin America here too, because it's a real financial center and a very like the key financial center for, for Latin America. And so there's it, just a lot going on. And, and we decided that this is a place where you can live and you can, you can have all of the convenience of, you know, a developed city, anything that we need, those shopping malls and everything that we could possibly want is here. It's also cheaper than the UK. It's not quite as cheap as places like Mexico, but it's a great place to be if you if you want to establish residency, if you do have an online business, because it has a lot of tax advantages too. It's a really interesting, dynamic place. And we've met friends here and, and we're just really enjoying it. That's great. And you've been out, you've seen some other parts of the country as well? Yeah, that's right. We've traveled up to a couple of places on the coast. There are some beautiful beaches and we're planning a few more trips um, in the coming months as well. And that's one of our plans is to, to check out, you know, what other places there could be that may be more beach oriented. Because although Panama City is actually on, on the coast, you know, it's not a beach. And the water here is, is definitely you wouldn't want to go anywhere near swimming. In it. it's, <laughs> it's right near the canal. and It's also quite polluted. So this is really urban, but there are beautiful beaches because you've got the Caribbean coast as well as the Pacific coast. So yeah, that's something that we've enjoyed uh, checking out. And uh, we just went to a beautiful place on the Pacific coast and, and we're going to check out the Caribbean coast next. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I was there about a year ago. And I was impressed with some of the secluded, like, there's a lot of beaches there that are kind of untouched. Like, it's not your typical place where there's, you know, tourists running around everywhere. Like, you can go places where there really aren't many tourists at all. And and that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, I'm sure they're going to be building that up at some point. But yeah, it's not really a tourist destination. I mean, it, it is that there are tourist places, but it doesn't have nearly the same amount of activity as, for example, some of the Mexican beach towns. Right. So, yeah, we've seen beaches that are just empty. So it, it's beautiful. And there's a lot to explore as well. And Panama City, too, is it, because it's a working town. It's very much like people do speak English here, but but it is 
a working town. It's not a tourist town. And right. so consequently, you speak Spanish a lot more. And, and uh, you know, it just has a vibe of somewhere that's got its own identity and is getting on with things. And your Espanol is uh, getting más mejor. <laughs> Very slowly, very okay. slowly. <laughs> I have to admit that um, I've been focusing on writing, especially the book that I've just published, Job Free. That's the next step is now that I've got this out, I want to get back into uh, improving my Spanish. Because when you sit at home and work from home, and especially my wife and I obviously speak English to each other, so yeah. we don't do as much practicing as we'd like to, but <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> it's could, coming slowly. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I could see how that would be. Maybe you just write your book and just uh, redo it now in Spanish. Yeah, right. That would certainly be a steep learning curve. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's talk about your book. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I liked that it was, I liked the way you divided up the different sections, and we'll get into each section, but it's an easy read. And I think anyone that wants to go off and do something other than kind of the traditional route of the, you know, the corporate planned out route, I think it's really a must read because it, it really kind of outlines what you can do, what are your options, and how you can do each one. So I really liked it for that for that part. And then you even included some stuff on investing in psychology. And so I think it's it's got overall, it's got a lot packed into a, a relatively short book. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I think that was one of the things with this book. You know, I mentioned before that I wrote the book on becoming an entrepreneur. But I what I wanted to do after that book was to really not look not just at the route that I took to a job free life, but to look at the other ways that people can take and the options that are out there. Because especially because everyone gets trained in school and university to think of life in terms of a career of jobs and to think about how you get a good job, that these options for living job free are not clear and they're not some they're not something that you get taught about in school. And consequently I wanted to really provide as much information for anyone thinking about this as possible, not just in terms of one way of doing it, but in terms of what the different choices are. Yeah, that's it's so needed out there. So Let's talk about the four ways. So uh, you have four ways to become or to be job free. And um, I noticed you left out homelessness, which is probably a good thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are obviously there are I think there are not there are other ways of doing this that I would not recommend. <laughs> yeah. But these are the four ways that I think uh, provide positive, fulfilling lifestyles. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is extreme savings. Now, I'm not uh, inclined to this. Uh, that's not my route. But I'm wondering, from your perspective, how painful does this need to be? And, or, or can it be done in a way that's not painful? Well, you know, I think it can be. And it's very much dependent on what people's personal choices are. So the concept of extreme saving is basically to put away more than 50% of your income from your job. Ideally, you want to be putting away 75% for 10 years and then if you, you know, or some time scale similar to that, depending on various assumptions. And if you do that, then you're able to save enough to be able to live frugally from your investments. And this is not the path that I took, but I have met people and interviewed people on my podcast who've done this route. And in terms of your question of, is it, you know, is it possible? I think, especially if you're a highly paid employee, you know, if you're an engineer or you have some kind of job where you're earning a relatively good living, then what tends to happen is that that money tends to get spent on lifestyle. So people buy a nice big house and a nice big car and they uh, tend to consume their wealth. And the idea behind extreme saving is to say, well, what if you just don't let that lifestyle inflation creep in if you if you stick to a very frugal lifestyle and just put away the additional money that you earn then you can use that to give yourself freedom it's only doable if you're willing to live that lifestyle and if you're willing to pursue a life of a very significant frugal choices you know you've got to be putting away 50 to 75 percent of your income you know there are pros and cons to each of these approaches but i think it is very viable especially for those people who don't really feel drawn towards entrepreneurship. This is a way to live job free from the position of being an employee. You know, it's going to take 10 years, but once you've done that, you're out and you can do whatever you like with your time. Yeah. So this requires a lot of planning and knowing your numbers, right? Definitely. I mean, you've really got to look carefully at both. The, the key thing is the saving. You know, investing, we, we, we can talk about that too. And there are various choices that you have to make. But the thing that people find really difficult is 
sticking to the lifestyle that's going to enable them to do that kind of really extreme saving. Because, you know, it's considered to be good if you'd save 10% of your income. We're talking about 50 to 75%. This is a very, very different lifestyle from the norm. Yeah, that means living in places maybe that aren't your ideal locations, maybe aren't your the ideal size and doing things like finding discounts and in your, all your shopping and uh, really trying to cut corners wherever you can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the three things that are most, the, the three areas that people tend to focus on are housing, transport, and food. Mm-hmm. Those are the three areas where you get most bang for your buck, especially the first most important being housing. Because that, you know, what tends to happen is people do take out a big mortgage and they buy as much house as they can early on with the view that, oh, this is going to appreciate in value. And that ends up being the only big investment that they, quote, investment that they ever make in mm-hmm. their life, even though it's actually a consumption item if it's your own house. Right. So the idea here is rather than buying as much house as you can, the idea is you rent probably or you buy something very cheap and you basically live well within your means, probably not in the kind of upper middle class neighborhoods and, and these types of places where the lifestyle is also going to cause you to spend a lot of money because you, you'll be keeping up with your neighbors, so to speak. So the people who make this choice tend to, to really focus on housing and on transport where they tend to avoid getting expensive cars. Ideally, they, they bike around or, or walk or use public transport or just buy a really cheap car. And that means living in walkable neighborhoods too. And then food. And, and that's really the question there is, you know, not eating out as much because that's where a lot of money can get eaten up. So uh, those are the kinds of key areas that people who follow this approach tend to focus on. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, I, I was saying maybe you can't live in the location you want to, but I, uh, that's almost not really true because a lot of people, uh, you know, I live in San Diego for uh, most of the year and it's an expensive city for sure. But there's a lot of people that will say, oh, I wish I could live in San Diego. I just can't afford it. But then I know somebody that's a friend just got an apartment for $750 a month. It's 10 minutes from downtown. So, Mm. you know, it's doable. I mean, maybe you have to, you know, give up some other things to do it. But there's sometimes you can get everything you want. You just have to look at what is it that's really important to you, right? Definitely, definitely. I mean, there are obviously some areas that are just significantly more expensive to live like San Francisco and, and places like that, which are just like the, it's hard to find low cost accommodation. But in general, it is about the choices that you make within a, each market. Like how much space do you really need? Yeah. How big a place do you really need? What kind of neighborhood do you really need to live in? So these are some of the choices that people make. And, and I, as I said, I think it, it, where you choose to live has a big effect because people tend to spend similarly to the level of the neighborhood that they're in, you know. So when right. often what, what can happen is that sometimes, for example, parents can think that they're helping their children when they leave home by helping them get a mortgage in a really nice neighborhood. But actually what happens is that sets them up for the the sort of, you know, middle class spending patterns, the nice neighborhood spending patterns, which <laughs> tend to then go on and make they, they find it difficult to actually be frugal. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, the next section is unjobbing. So can you can you talk mm. about what that is? Yeah, I think this approach is really the idea. It's In a way, it's similar to extreme saving. But the approach here is to say, well, if you don't like your job and you're not finding it fulfilling and you find that every day you're going in and it, it just drains you psychologically, mentally, then the question is, what do you really need in order to be happy? And one of the things that the unjobbing, people who do unjobbing, the approach that they take is to think that, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the money that you're earning in the job that you find unfulfilling is actually going to support the lifestyle of this job that you're doing. So it's kind of a vicious circle. You've got this big mortgage to pay and big car to to repayments to make, and you're spending all this time commuting in and out and having no free time. So you, you end up treating yourself with you know more more toys and goods that that make you feel better in order to to kind of give yourself a way through with this job that is unfulfilling and unjobbers tend to say okay well what can i do that would be really fulfilling for me and oftentimes that doesn't involve earning as much money but if you are getting fulfillment from what it is that you do every day you may not need that money mm-hmm. because the key thing is that you know if it doesn't feel like work then your, your work can become a joy in its own right. So the person that, that uh, I really think of with this is the guy who wrote the book Unjobbing, which is, was in the, in the 90s, this guy, Michael Fogler, who I interviewed for the book. 
And he's a good example. So he, he wanted to get a job as a classical guitarist. And he tried for many years to get a teaching position as in a university as a classical music uh, guitarist. And there were not that many teaching positions around to do that. And he realized after some years that for a long time, he'd been doing lots of side hustles and things that he enjoyed doing just to, to make money while he kind of tried to get his career started. And he realized that he didn't really want a career. He was quite happy not having a job, but doing things that were meaningful to him, whether that's smaller freelance work or little side projects that are fulfilling that you can do that bring you fulfillment every day of your life, even though uh, you know, you're not necessarily earning as much as you would do if you were in a traditional job, you have the freedom that comes from doing what it is that you want to do. Yeah, that's interesting. I, that, that's one. I have a friend that he kind of does that. He's worked at this grocery chain here, Trader Joe's. And it's basically a place where if you've been there for a while, you can kind of call your own hours. You can, you can work the hours that you want to work. Mm. And he's been able to kind of have this freedom-oriented life with working you know, maybe 50-hour weeks for a while and then taking a three-week trip to Thailand or something. And it's, it's really interesting because he doesn't make a lot of money, of course, but he does have a lot of freedom at the same time. Yeah. And I think the key thing is that it depends on what you want, because in this approach, you're not necessarily going to have a lot of money saved up and invested to give you that financial independence that you might get from other approaches. But for some people, that's okay. Michael Fogler is still unjobbing in his 60s and he seems happy. So, you know, it really depends on what's important to you and what you want. But I think the key thing for the unjobbing approach is it's really a, a philosophy or a psychological sort of approach to, mm -hmm. to work, to think, why am I doing this job in the first place? And, you know, is it really worth it to me to have all the costs associated with the job? And could I live a more fulfilled life if I chose a different level of consumption if I was more frugal, but I was able to do what I want with my time. And I was able to make a living doing stuff that is fulfilling in its own right. Right, right. So the next one is lifestyle business. This is my favorites. You mentioned something in the chapter on lifestyle business. I mean, there's a lot to talk about here, but you mentioned something about the differences between recurring and passive income. And I thought that was interesting because people don't really realize that those are two different things. Yeah. Well, I think the, the key thing here is, I mean, the idea of a lifestyle business is, is the most sort of famous popularizer of this is Tim Ferriss, of course, with the four hour work week. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is that you take a business, you use a business as a vehicle to give you freedom. So you, you design a business very consciously to give you as much free time as possible. And that's where his concept of the four hour work week comes from. And that's why he talks a lot about passive income, as do many people. As a concept, it's great. And this is something that a lot of people are able to do in order to give them the freedom to travel and live abroad. And they're able to benefit from so-called geo arbitrage, where they live in cheap places, but they sell online products to you know more uh, developed markets and, and things like that. The thing about this approach, though, is that I think it's very easy to assume that you're going to, if you have an online business, that you're going to have passive income, income that, that just keeps coming in without you having to actively do that much to live this four hour work week dream. But there is a huge difference between passive income and recurring income. And often if you have online products, you may have recurring income. In other words, you might have income that keeps coming in, but it may not be passive in the sense that you might have to do a huge amount of work to keep that income stream coming in. So I think it's worth bearing in mind that sometimes people think that they'll be able to design this, this business that's going to be a four hour work week job, but actually they end up having to spend a lot more time keeping the business healthy and keep making sure that their income keeps coming in. So I think it's important to think about how you feel about being an entrepreneur and how much you know, fulfillment and interest and, and excitement you're going to get from the running of the business itself too, because not everyone manages to get down to, to, to that small amount of time per week to keep their business running. Right. And I noticed the change, the shift that's happened over the past few years. It used to be that you could have a lot more. I used to have a lot more passive income. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you create an ebook and you put it up on a website, you create a sales page 
and you've got traffic coming to the site that's that's buying your product and you don't really have to do much else besides that but then over the years it became a lot more important to, for people to sort of have a community and to be able to have access to the person that wrote the book not just download a book and and read it and then there's nothing else so yeah i, yeah, I found that this is this is something that has changed uh, quite a bit and I, I like that you pointed this out because recurring income is something that i don't really have i mean i've done a little bit of that but i I, what I found is that when I set up like a membership site and it's a monthly membership, people expect new stuff every month. So you mm. are going to be working a lot more than if you sell like a digital product, like a like yeah. a book or a video or something like that, or just sell your membership site as a one-time fee instead of every month you're going to expect something different. So I think that's a big yeah. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense. I think as online business has started, has matured. And you know more and more ebooks are available. Then there's just a lot more competition, which means that you do have to do a lot more to really connect with your audience. So I think that is probably a reflection of how the overall market's changed over the years. Yeah, absolutely. So the next one is startups, and my curiosity about this, I've never done a startup or been really a part of one. But I did do a lot of investigating into startups, especially when I was living up in Boulder, where there was a big startup scene and a lot of meetups and things going on. I'm wondering why bother with doing a startup? It seemed that there were so many and there are so many and most of them don't make it. So they spend, you know, maybe five years of their lives working crazy hours and then turns out their company goes under or something. So I'm wondering yeah. from your perspective, yeah, why bother? And then what do the statistics really look like? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because I, I faced that question myself in the beginning with my startup too and I definitely thought about the potential for me to spend five years and in fact five years was my timeline. I thought to myself I am going to really push this for five years and at the end of five years I'm either going to know that this has been you know a great success or I'm just going to quit and I'm going to go and get a job and at the end of it, it actually took me a bit longer, but at the end of five years, we were profitable and we'd paid back all our loans and we were then in the process of looking towards selling. And it, it, it was seven years before we really managed to seal the deal to sell the company. But still, you know, I could see that it was definitely worth continuing and it was definitely, you know, a success. But I was okay with the potential for it not to be. And the reason I was okay with it is because I think if you want to do a startup, of course, people think about exiting and the potential for financial independence. And that's great. You know, I mean, it's definitely been a really great experience for me doing that. But I originally started it knowing that that wasn't, you know, there was no guarantees about that at all. And I also had no clue how much work it would take to make that happen. I knew that I really wanted to create a business to do what my business did because I did feel passionate about it and I did think that it was a fascinating and interesting and important and valuable thing to provide on the market. And I think that's the psychology behind why people do startups. If you go into a startup thinking, oh, I'm going to do this and in three years I'm going to be rich and then I'm going to retire to the beach, then it's going to be really depressing mm -hmm. to do it because there's so much failure and so many times you have to change your business model and you have to change what it is that you're doing and adapt that you have to do that because you really gain fulfillment from the process too. So that's why people do it. And, you know, the thing about startups, there are a lot of startups that fail, but that's not the same thing as individual entrepreneurs. Often individual entrepreneurs can have concepts and realize that that's not going to work and then they just change the company or they start a different business. So it's not as if, you know, you only have one shot. You can also, if you want to get into the startup world, you know, you may find that you, you try different ideas and then you find one that really has momentum that you're able to push forward with. So that's, I think, the, the answer to that approach is that it's not going to work if you think of it in terms of just a get-rich-quick scheme. Startups are a, a great adventure and they're an opportunity to create something that really reflects what it is that you think is important and that's the real fulfillment and if you're able to really dedicate to yourself to it then there is also the opportunity of eventually exiting which is great too yeah so it, it sounds like it really is all about having passion behind the idea rather than how much money can this make and how big can we be 
Yeah, and in in many ways, you know, if you if you have passion, obviously, ultimately, if the if the the money is a reflection of the fact that you are providing value. Right. So if you're doing a startup and you just cannot get anyone to buy anything, then that is important information because it means that whatever you think is important, other people are not connecting with. And in many ways, I found that that's, there's a lot of humility involved in that because you have to adjust and realize that, okay, what I thought was so great, other people are clearly telling me that it just doesn't serve them. It's this product is not the way that people want to be helped. And so how can I find a way to help people? and to remove a pain point or to provide value. And in my business, for example, we originally had a concept that was going to be an online application. It was going to be software as a service, and that's not what people wanted for the particular niche that I was in. Mm -hmm. They wanted consultancy work, so we had to change. But I still really was excited by the idea of of helping, in, in my case, it was helping improve pedestrian environments, helping architects and property developers to create better shopping malls and better street networks that, that work better for people walking around. And so I was able to change and pivot the business because I understood that in order to really help people, I needed to listen to them as well and change my ideas where necessary. Absolutely. So there's another section in the book that I'm really glad that you put in there, and that was the psychology of not having a job. Because it all sounds great when we talk about this stuff, all the freedom that you're going to have without having a job and have to go in somewhere to work and you can do whatever you want. But then there are some challenges with not having a job and having to do it all yourself. So uh, can you talk about that a little bit, what your findings were? Yeah. I mean, much of the book is about these practical challenges. How are you going to make a living outside of a job? But I think in many ways, the, the really big challenge is the psychological one. Because it is living outside the kind of career job paradigm is psychologically challenging. Mm -hmm. And it, whichever route that you take, whichever of these four different approaches you take, you know, you're going to encounter these psychological challenges. And the three that seem really important to me that I know I have thought a lot about, the kinds of things that you don't have in a job that you have to replace if you have a job-free lifestyle. So, for example, you know, there's the question of community. Jobs provide a lot of community. Even crappy jobs give you a social network. They give you, you know, people who you work with every day and you can share experiences with and, and they give you people to go and have a drink after work with and, and a, a structure to kind of progress within. And so if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to create all of that yourself. You have to create... You have to get out there in the marketplace and you know meet your customers and your clients and and you also have to bring people together if you can for example start a startup you have to create a community around your business and you also need to find your own social network because you're not going to get it from work because you're not from your job that is you're gonna, you know you, you actually have to create that yourself so that's one of the uh, big challenges that I think is really important. Another one is, oh, did you want to say anything about that one? No, I just, I can really relate to all this because of having previously had jobs and had the exact experience that you just described with, you know, you've got people that you can chat about your weekend with on Monday morning and you've got people to go out with after work once in a while and uh, it sort of becomes your social life and then you get out in the world of not having that kind of a thing and it is a challenge. There's that thing called entrepreneurial loneliness, which is, mm. is really, really a, a real thing. And I've definitely experienced that. And uh, so, yeah. So anyway, just you know, continue. Yeah. And I, I think it's one of those things that it's very easy to, to not really consider that as an important challenge because you're so focused on how we're going to make some money and so forth. But I think a lot of people really suffer with that and, and especially because they're not prepared for it. So another one is, is actually is structure. You know, one of the things about jobs and even bad jobs is that they provide structure for your life. There's something to get up for and get out of bed for and put on your clothes for. Yep. There's a place to go. There's dates in your diary, things to do. There's also deadlines and, that are given to you. And so you have all of this structure to work within. And when you're an entrepreneur or when you're doing any of these other more entrepreneurial routes, you have to create all that structure for yourself. You know, it's up to you to get out of bed and get active and get productive and make appointments and get things happening. And that is something that has been a, a real challenge for me is realizing that when I became an entrepreneur, I really had to 
up my productivity game and learn about productivity and learn about, okay, well, how am I going to structure my life so that I'm actually doing what's important so that I'm getting things done and I'm not just waking up and checking email and Facebook and then realizing that hours have passed and what have I done with my day? And so th these are some of the challenges. I think that it's easier within a job to, to work within structure that's given to you and it takes more self-discipline and more self-organization to actually, you know, do, create that structure for yourself. Yeah, the structure thing is, it, it, that can become a big challenge. I think that also goes back to passion. Like if you're passionate about what you do, or if you're excited about what you do, then it's easier to get up in the morning and sort of start creating a structured day. Whereas if it's kind yeah. of like you're just doing it for the money and you need to do it, then that can be tough because it's then, then it's like the discipline kind of falls apart or you start becoming disciplined in things that aren't resulting in production of your, of your work. Totally. And the last one I just wanted to mention was in a way it's very related to the other two. And that is the question of finding purpose. This is something I think that a lot of people struggle with when they think about starting a company or starting a business is they think, well, I don't really know what I would do. I don't, I'm not really sure what my business would do. I don't really feel you know, very strongly about anything and or I can't think of how I could create a business or what it would do. And in a way, you know, one of the, this is another thing that jobs give you. Somebody else has defined the purpose. If you have a job, then you are working towards the common purpose of the business that you work for. You've got an employer who's defined the purpose and then you can find ways to achieve that purpose. And, you know, you can obviously influence it too. But when you're an entrepreneur, it's up to you to define the purpose not only for the, the business, but also for yourself in terms of you know, where this is all going. So I think that's a real challenge, and, and especially because it's so important as an entrepreneur, especially if you're going to be working with other people, for you to be the source of enthusiasm and the source of inspiration for the purpose of what it is you're doing. And going outside that job paradigm really confronts you with that challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Now you had also a section on investing. I thought that was also a really great thing to have in the book because at some point people are going to make enough money to where, what do you do with it? And even if it's a little bit of money or if it's a lot of money, there still has to be some sort of plan on what you're going to do with it. And I wanted to hone in on the part you talked about the permanent portfolio, because I also mm. am a fan of Harry Brown's work and I, I think that's a really great way to go. So I want to talk a little bit about that and what your thoughts are on it. Is, does it still work today? Is it still something that's viable and that can, that can work in, in terms of like a conservative type of investment? Yeah. So just to explain as a bit of background, uh, as you mentioned, everyone who, who starts to work towards more financial freedom is going to have to decide what to do with their money and where to put it. And so the idea of that section of the book is to give an overview of some of the decisions that you're going to face and some of the decisions that I faced. And so, for example, I know that some people prefer to, to take a more active investing approach where they think they're going to find the next hot tip and they're going to find the next big thing and they're going to invest their money there and then hope to make a, a ton of money by having essentially beaten the market. And the alternative to that is the passive investing approach, which is to say, I'm not going to try and beat the market. I just want to get whatever returns the market is able to give me. And so I'm going to invest in a way that's a much more passive investment where I'm not trying to pick individual stocks or individual commodities and so forth. I'm just investing in a way that I know is going to protect me in the long term. And there are lots and lots of different approaches to this. Some people just decide, okay, well, I'm just going to put everything in stocks and I'm not going to even think about it. And of course, it's going to go up and down, but in the long run, stocks are probably going to go up. I didn't take that approach. I, I was very influenced, as you say, by Harry Brown because his approach was to say, well, if you want to do passive investing, there's lots of different things that could happen to the economy. You could be going into a recession uh, where you have tight money like there was in the early 80s, or you could be going into really high inflation like there was in the 1970s, or you could be going into a sort of depression, which is like what they had in the 30s and in a way was kind of like what we've had since uh, 2008 in some ways. Or you could be in a period of growth like it was in the 90s. So the thing is, different assets are going to perform better in each of these different phases of, of the economy. And the idea of the permanent portfolio is basically to say, well, I'm going to hold assets that are likely to perform well in each of these different phases of the economy. And then I'm just going to rebalance periodically. So that means 
whenever one asset gets significantly more, you, you hold four different asset classes, and whenever one gets significantly more than all the others, then I'm going to sell that back down so that I have 25% each. And, or if one drops significantly lower, then I'll, I'll uh, sell some of the other higher ones and, and rebalance. And that means that you essentially you're forcing yourself to always sell high and buy low. Even when you think, oh, I don't know why I'm buying stocks at the moment because everyone else says it's a really bad plan. But it, you know, if, if the stocks are performing relatively badly or gold or bonds, whatever it is, then you're, you're essentially forcing yourself to sell the things that have gone up in value and to buy the things that are low in value on the basis that in the years ahead, something's going to change and you just want to be protected so that you're hedged so that whatever changes, you know, you're going to be okay. That was the basic approach of the permanent portfolio. But I think you had some more questions about it. So, uh, yeah, what was it? What else was it that you were yeah, thinking? I, I do like the permanent portfolio because it kind of takes the thinking out of it, like the emotions out of it, which usually screws most people up in, in their investment in their investing. But um, I look at uh, what about when things change? Like now we have Bitcoin. How would Harry Brown look at that? Like, is that just something that is more speculative and, you know, leave it out? Or because I would think you want to have the, you know, some exposure to Bitcoin in a permanent portfolio because it's kind of, it's almost like digital gold at this point. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And I've thought a lot about it. I mean, Bitcoin is still, in terms of market capitalization, it's still tiny compared to gold, for example, which is the, the big inflation hedge in the permanent portfolio. But then again, Bitcoin's actually even more flexible than gold because in a way it performs like cash in some ways too. Mm -hmm. So I think it is an interesting, you know, for the future, cryptocurrencies are definitely changing the, the, the landscape of finance. At the moment, it's still such early days that if I had to guess, I would say Harry Brown would say that's speculation at yeah. the moment because there's not enough data and there's not enough time to know what's going to happen to Bitcoin. But Harry Brown's was always very pragmatic and flexible. And he made the point that, look, the permanent portfolio is for the money that you cannot afford to lose, that you want to put in a safe place. But there's nothing to stop you from also speculating with some money. So, for example, you can have a permanent portfolio, but say, you know what, I'm going to hold some Bitcoin as well, because I think that is really going to change the landscape. And if it does, then even if you only hold a small amount, then in future it's going to, you know, if it really does change the landscape, then you'll be fine. But otherwise, if it doesn't, then you've still got your sort of safe assets, if you like. So that's the way I think about it. I think if you were to go significantly into Bitcoin and change the permanent portfolio to hold way more, then it would be a slightly different thing than a passive portfolio in the same way that, that Harry Brown originally anticipated. But that's not to say that you shouldn't hold Bitcoin because I know I've done episodes on Bitcoin in my podcast as well. And I, I think it's I think it's awesome and really fascinating. But I think if if I would, would guess, I would say that it's still too early days for it to be something that Harry Brown would have suggested as a passive investment. Yeah, that makes total sense. That actually helps me think about it in in, in a way that is help uh a way that is beneficial to, you know, the way I'm investing as well. So, well, it, it's really been great, uh, Jake, having you on. And your book, Job Free, it's available on your website? Yes, you can get it at my website, which is thevoluntarylife.com. And it's also on Amazon. So you can just look on Amazon. It's called Job Free, Four Ways to Quit the Rat Race and Achieve Financial Freedom on Your Own Terms. Yeah, and I, I highly recommend it. I read the book and it's an easy read, but it's got a lot of great information in it for anyone that's doing something in the realm of trying to break free from the matrix. So uh, so I, I highly recommend it and I'll have the link to all of this in the show notes. What's next for you? Are you staying, you said you're staying in Panama for a while? Yeah, that's right. Um, I've got more writing projects and uh, we're enjoying our life here in Panama. We're going to see how it goes for a while. You know, maybe do some more slow travel, move around a bit. But for the moment, we're just uh, really enjoying it here. My wife, Hannah, has a, an online business in personal development, coaching and, and resources. And I'm, I'm doing my writing and, and enjoying that. So, yeah, this is where our life is at the moment. Yeah, I picture, you know, it's funny because you mentioned that Panama City, there's no beaches there. But for some reason, uh, when we talk about Panama, I always think of like, tropical beach sitting sitting there with a margarita <laughs> and you know tanning and stuff like that yeah well i'll be doing a lot of that at the weekends that's for sure yeah yeah that's awesome yeah i hope you do well great awesome it's been really fun having you on jake again and i just realized that this is actually the third time we've yeah, i had you on the uh, freedom loving podcast so 
I misspoke, but um, oh yeah, but yeah, cool. Every, every time is really awesome, and you've you've got so much great information, and yeah, look forward to the next uh, the next book you write, so we can we can have you on again. Thanks so much, Kevin. It's been really fun talking to you. All right. Well, yeah, good luck with everything you're doing. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Freedom Lovin' Podcast. To break free today, head on over to freedomlovin.com and download our free guide, Seven Practical Tips to Living Free in an Unfree World. <laughs>